All right, good evening, all of you, good evening. We are going to have the online classroom in a few seconds. Let me just now proceed to my desk. All right. Hello, hello, good evening. Okay, I hope that you are fine. How are you? Okay, the things goes on to point well right now. Okay, so again, the, the session today, it is a session on the CISG or the UN Convention on Contracts for uh, the International, International Sales of Good. Okay, so that uh, we have in there uh, over the past weeks, so we have covered so many things. Okay, so the, I think that last week we talked about the duty or the obligation of the seller to deliver the goods. And remember when we talk about the duty or the obligation of the sellers to deliver the goods, we talk about uh, the obligation to make sure that the good, uh, the goods conform with the contract. Okay, so uh, we spent a lot of time last week talking about you know the conformity of the goods. And if you remember well, okay, one of the things which are very important in relation to uh, the obligation to make sure that the goods conform with the contract is that the goods need to be fit for purposes. Remember, we talk about. <coughs> what is known as the merchantability. Okay, we talked about the concept of merchantability, okay, the last last week. Uh, I hope that you can remember, okay, when when the, we come across the word merchantability, that is the concept under which the goods to be delivered by the seller to the buyer need to be fit for the purposes. Okay, there are in fact two, remember, uh, two aspects. The first one, it is fitness for ordinary purposes that means that the goods will have to be fit for purposes okay for which the goods of uh, that tide uh, are ordin are going to be uh, ordinarily used okay the, so the, but we also have you know the concept regarding the fitness for particular purpose remember uh, fitness for particular purpose it is uh, the fitness in a way that the goods will have to be fit uh, for the purpose for the purposes which are made known okay to the seller okay even though those purposes are not ordinary ordinary purposes but they are the purposes contemplated okay by the contracts if you can remember well uh, we have article 35 two in the cisg let me them in the give me just a few, a few seconds uh, for me to just uh, check okay the, on this uh, device okay that to make sure that I now see what's going on in this online classroom I should see myself here okay so that if things go wrong then I can just make correction just uh, on time okay just give me just a few seconds all right Okay, very fine. I now I can see myself on this device. Okay, so uh, <coughs> here. So if things go wrong, and uh, I can just okay that uh, see your messages. Please make sure that uh, if you see anything. Okay, going wrong, okay, then you can just leave me the messages and when I see messages, I will have to just, okay, the, uh, make adjustments uh, to suit your convenience. If you do not have any messages, I should presume that everything is going on very well. Okay, back to what we see on the screen now. Remember, in the CISG, we have article 35, 35 to, 35 to A and B, remember. According to 35 okay, the goods uh, need to conform with the contract, okay, in the sense that they are fit for the purposes for which the goods of the same description would ordinarily be used. So the 32, 32, uh, sorry, 35 a okay, the, in fact, it directs at what? Uh, directs at the fitness for, for what? Fitness for ordinary purposes. Why the 35, 
35.2b uh, says that, okay, the goods will have to be what? The goods will have to be fit for any particular purpose expressly or impliedly made known to the seller at the time of the conclusion of the contract. Okay, so the uh, 35.2b signifies the fitness for particular purposes. Okay, so I have brought to attention already that the concepts of you know fitness for purposes which we see in Article 35.2a or b. Uh, that is not anything new at all because it has been seen, it has been uh, known in many jurisdictions, okay, including in the UK and in the United States of America, okay, so today we will look at, you know, the, the UK law and also the US law, okay, on this point, okay, so we will look at, you know, the legal notions regarding merchantability, okay, as developed first in the English law and when we explore, you know, the English law, then we will uh, move on to consider the same position, parallel position in the American law, okay, so in the UK, as you may be well way right? okay the, in the uk they have also you know the, the the particular act known as the you know the sales of goods act the sales of goods act the current uh, act it is the you know, 1979 act okay the, of course I mean this act has been amended on the many occasions okay so that uh, if we look at the concept regarding you know merchability uh, in this act okay for short i'm going to call this act coga okay soccer okay the sales of goods act okay so the concept regarding merchability is also embodied in the you know the, the sale of good sales of goods act 1979 in fact before the act of 1979 there were also uh, several sales of goods acts okay the previous versions right but the, and the concept of merchability uh, has been also known you know, in the previous sales of goods acts as, as well okay but the current one is the uh, the Act of 1979. Uh, if you look at, at the Act, the, pre, the previous Act, okay, uh, we can see that the e English law seems to, you know, seem to undergo the development of this of this concept. Uh, at first, the court did not have, you know, there a lot of ideas surrounding, you know, the merchability. Even though, you know, the concept of merchability uh, was also found in the previous Self of Goods Act. But I mean, in those days, the court did not seem to develop the ideas as much. Okay, what the court seemed to, uh, you know, seem to develop in the, in the old days is that in order for the goods to be fit, in order for the goods to be merged, merchantable, or we would like, to, if we would like to use the word, you know, used in the see, uh, sorry, in the in the act, if we would like the goods to be of the merchantable merchantable quality. Okay, the court so thought that the goods would have to be what? The goods would have to be, the goods would have to be, you know, the, to be the uh, good, of, all right. Okay, according to the, the idea of the reasonable, reasonable buyer. Okay, so the idea first developed by court seemed to be the idea of reasonable buyer. Okay, so the test whether or not the good would be fit or the good would, would be, uh, of merchantability, sorry, merchantable quality is that the goods would have to be acceptable. The goods would have to be found, you know, acceptable by a reasonable buyer. Okay, so that, but, but after that, the court seemed to develop the idea, okay, into the idea which is which is based upon the fitness, fitness for purposes, okay, which um, can be, uh, you know, uh, split, split into fitness for ordinary ordinary purposes and fitness for particular purposes okay so before the concept surrounding you know fitness for purposes okay we should look at the idea uh, which seem to you know which seem to be founded upon you know the reasonable bias test okay the, we can see this idea you know the in the you know, in a leading case here the leading case known as bristol trump's way and fit models okay so the in fact in this case was decided okay that based upon you know the previous version of the sales of goods act the sales of goods act 1893 okay that is the version before the current version okay the current version remember it is the sales of goods act 
1979. Okay, but at the time of the decision, okay, the Census of Goose Act in force at the time, it is the Census of Goose Act 1893, which also had the concept of merchantability. Okay, the, 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 the act, this act also required goods to be of merchantable quality. Okay, and uh, this case arose. Okay, the, this case was brought before the court, and uh, so that the court would have to, you know, to find whether or not okay the goods in question were of merchantable quality according to this act. All right, it was concerned with the purchase of what the sales of the sale of fiat uh, minibus. Okay, a fiat a fiat minibus. Okay, something like this. I mean, you, you look at them in the you can just uh, see from uh, the photo here, okay, for the picture here in the OCA, okay? The thing is that the fit minibus, okay, the minibus would have to be, of course, used for what? For carrying people or carrying the, you know, passengers. But in this case, if you look at the name of the case, it is Bristol Tramways and Fiat Motors, okay? So the, the omnibus, omnibus here would have to be used in Bristol. I don't know whether, you know, the... Uh, you, I mean, in this class, you know, anything about, uh, you know, the Bristol City, okay, that I try to, you know, to put a picture for you here, this is Bristol. Bristol, of course, it is one of the cities, in fact, large cities in the UK, okay, and uh, Bristol, it is, I mean, known as a mountainous city, so the, it, uh, it has a lot of hills, okay, so if you go to this town, this, this city indeed, okay, you have to just walk, uh, I mean, uh, in you know hilly areas. So in this case, when the buyer bought this, you know the Fiat uh, omnibus, the buyer would like to use this omnibus for uh, for what? I mean, for I mean, carrying people in the Bristol, which for which has been known for you know the for the, the uh, areas which which seem to be hilly, okay, or mountainous, so that. This uh, mini minibus seemed to be fine in the sense that it could be used for you know driving from place to place, okay. But the thing is that uh, it might not be to a very, very fit you know for 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 I mean conveyance of passengers around Bristol, okay, the hill is the city here, okay. Uh, and when this bus uh, was purchased, it broke down too often, okay? and uh, of course when the when it broke down too often. To obtain like this, I mean, it became unfit for uh, this for the purpose of you know carrying passengers in a mountainous or hilly areas. Okay, so the question was whether or not the seller de delivered the goods which uh, which were of merchantable quality according to the census of Act eighteen ninety three. Okay, and uh, in this case, the court held that well, the bus which was manufactured here, okay, the by, by by the defendant, the seller, okay, the uh, the bus buses which were manufactured by the defendant, uh, which were built okay for heavily city traffic, okay. So when these buses could not be used by properly in you know in 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 Bristol City, it would not be fit. It would not be maybe it would not be fit for the for this purpose the purpose of carrying passengers in this hilly or mountainous city, okay. But the court would have to uh, give the interpretation of merchantable, merchantable quality in the civil in the civil of Guzak, not 1893, okay. And the interesting thing is this: when the court considered the expression merchantable quality, uh, which uh, which was embodied in, you know, the Sales of Goods Act 1893. The court delivered a very, very interesting speech here. The court said that while well, the, the goods would have to be, the goods would be considered as, you know, the, as being of merchantable quality if the article is of such quality and in such condition that a reasonable man acting reasonably would, after full examination, exhibit under the circumstances of the case. Okay, so what was said by the court here uh, has been known as, you know, the reasonable, reasonable buyer standard. That means that according to the courts, okay, in, the, in those days, the goods would be of merchantable quality according to the Civil Goods Act when they 
where you know when they were acceptable by a reasonable buyer. Okay, so uh, uh, that is why we we, 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 we we say that you know that the court has the court in this case established you know the, the reasonable buyer standard. Right. But this test didn't seem to survive very very long because you know the UK has you know the new sales of goods act. The sale of goods act nineteen seventy nine and right uh, in this act we also see you know that the, the expression merchant of quality. Okay, the in section fourteen the paragraph six, okay, fourteen fourteen paragraph six of fourteen six say that Goods of any kind are of merchantable quality okay, if they are fit for the purposes or purposes sorry if they are fit for the purpose or purposes for which goods of that kind are commonly bought. So you said to put simply the court said that this act uh, this act requires a good to be what? To be fit okay for the purpose or the purposes for which they uh, they the uh, they are commonly bought, so we can see that I mean, this is just the fitness for ordinary purpose. So we, we have to just ask the question to, about you know, the purposes for which the goods of the same kind, the good of that kind, uh, uh, are uh, to be put into ordinary, ordinary use. A uh, car we have to be used for, for, for driving from place to place. So, that, so if the car can be driven, uh, from place to place, that's mean that this car is of merchantable quality in the sense that they, uh, the car is fit for you know the, its ordinary purpose. Okay, so the now today you know that uh, the the expression merchant, merchantable quality in the same goods act 1979 has been changed into satisfactory quality. Okay, if you look at you know the, the sales of goods act, okay, the sales of goods act. Right, uh, 1979 as amended. Okay, you can see that you know the concept of merchant quality has now been replaced by the concept of satisfactory quality. Even though you know there is a change from the merchant quality into the satisfactory, uh, fr from the, the merchant quality into the satisfactory quality, but the idea surrounding that seem to be I mean the, quite the same. Okay, but because of what? Because remember, if we go back to section fourteen two, okay, the which which require that the good be fit for you know the, the goods the good be of you know merchantable quality, right? Uh, the act require that in order for the goods to be of merchantable quality, the good would have to be fit for its ordinary purposes. Okay, the good would have to be fit for their ordinary purposes. Even though now you know that the act changed the concept of Merchant quality into secretary quality, but the idea of fitness for ordinary purposes still remain. Okay, because if you look at you know section fourteen two b, fourteen two b, okay, fourteen fourteen two b, the uh, before fourteen two b, look at fourteen fourteen two a first. Fourteen two a required the goods, okay, the good b of Satisfactory, satisfactory quality, okay, and 14 to be give an elaboration upon the satisfactory quality. Uh, it say that in order for the goods to be, in order to determine whether or not goods are of satisfactory, satisfactory quality, we will have to consider these factors, the factors listed in 14 to B, and if you look at factor number A here, among others. You can see that the act say that okay the, the goods will have to be fit for all the purposes for which goods of the kind in question are commonly supplied. Okay, so we can see that the ideas okay surrounding uh, surrounding the what surrounding the the satisfactory quality still surround what surrounding fitness for ordinary purposes. Okay, so the standard it is still the what? It is still the fitness for ordinary purposes standard. Right, so even though you know we have a change, uh, even though the act change, changes, you know, the concept of merchant quality into the satisfactory quality, okay, but 
your idea seems to be linked to the fitness for ordinary purposes. Okay, so we can say that okay in English law, okay, there is say the requirement that the goods be fit for their ordinary purposes. Okay, so when we uh, consider uh, the, the concept of the fitness for ordinary purposes, okay, according to the safety of good set, right? Uh, we have to uh, we have to just mean bring to attention okay, one of the very important cases known as Roger and Parish. In fact, this case was concerned with the sale of what? The sales of you know sale of the Range Range Rover. You know you know Range Rover, the car. Okay, the this car Range Rover. Okay, Range Rover. So it is known as the car of premium quality. Of course, I mean there are so many mix of saloons car. Okay, but I mean among the saloons car, Range Rover seem to seem to be at the forefront in terms of quality. It is not just you know the quality car, but it is the premium quality quality car. I mean the family car, of course. Okay, so that and what happened is that I mean the the, the car was sold from the I mean the the, the, the the seller to the buyer, the buyer is Roger in this case. I mean he uh, bought this car, okay, of course the Range Rover car, okay, the Range Rover car here. And the thing is that just after a few weeks, okay, the, the car. Uh, the car became very satisfactory, and when it became, you know, uh, sorry, the car became unsatisfactory. When the car became unsatisfactory, uh, the seller, the seller just replaced this car with another. Okay, so the, the seller just sent another car to replace, uh, you know, the, the 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 one which became unsatisfactory. Right. Even though you know that, even though the seller had the, the replacement car, the replacement car turned out again to have you know the, a number of small technical problems. Even though these technical problems did not make the car uns did not make the car unsafe, but even though you know, the car were still you know uh, drivable, it could be used for driving from place to place. But the thing is that. Okay, it, it I mean the uh, uh, when the it had when it had been driven for about I mean the, uh, about I mean the, uh, five thousand and five hundred uh, miles, right? I mean the, the the buyer did not want to take this car anymore. The buyer just rejected this car on the ground that the seller was in breach of merchantable policy. That means that according to the buyer, this car was not fit for. I mean that is ordinary purposes. Okay, so the uh, of course, I mean the in that case, I mean the, the the court would have to be considered the the merchant merchant quality according to the sale of Guzak 1979, the current uh, the the current sale of Guzak, right? Uh, the thing is that right uh, in this case, when this case was decided by the court of first instance, or we can just call. This court has the trial court. Okay, the trial court considered that well, there was no breach. There was no breach by the seller simply because this car could could still be used for driving from place to place. So that it was fit, it was perfectly fit for its ordinary ordinary purposes. Remember, the ordinary purpose for the use of this car is to drive this car from place to place and when the car you know could be driven from place to place we uh, can still see that you know this car was the duly fit for its ordinary purposes this is you know the uh, uh, judgment by the uh, trial court but when this case went to the court of appeal the court of appeal just overturned the decision of the trial judge and the court appeal just you know the address a very interesting observation okay the court appeal just look at the expectations of the buyer the court of appeal believe that well when customers when customers uh, buy this car customer will normally not just want to use the car this car for driving from place to place because this car has been known for premium quality when you drive if you are a customer if you want to buy this car, you want to drive it 
not just for I mean not just for communication from place to place but for you know for showing your work for showing your great pride okay you have to look great you have to look important you have to you have to find that you know this car is comfortable so these are all your expectations you know that and that is why uh, the court said this one the court said well the description Range Rover would conjure up a particular set of expectations not the same as those relating to an ordinary saloon car as to the balance between performance handling comfort and resilience okay the, and then the court the go on to say this one and this is very very important okay before i uh, read you know the speech the speech uh, delivered by the court I mean, let me just have a check on the, this device okay uh okay so far you know the messages seem fine i have received no message no message informing me of any technical problems okay so i should presume that everything goes on very very well right back to you know the speech delivered by the court here let's look at this judicial speech the court addressed this one starting with the purpose for which goods of that kind are commonly bought that means that the court will have to the court mean that the court was considering okay the ordinary purposes of this car okay the court said one would include okay when, when we consider you know the ordinary purposes of, of the car one would include in respect of any passenger vehicle not merely the buyer's purpose of driving the car from one place to another but of doing so okay with the, the appropriate degree of comfort is and handling and reliability and one may add of pride see in the vehicle's outward and interior appearance so what the court means is just that well you know when when customer when the buyer you know buy this car i mean the buyers just does not want to use this car for driving from place to place only the buyer want to use this car with great pride okay so you will have to destroy this great pride from using this car even if the car can be driven from place to place but if the car you know has even you know minor the problems even if the problems do not seem to be so serious the problems seem to be more, seem to be more minor than serious but if those minor problems do not result in the car you know the being driven with great pride then that car could not be said as being of you know merchant quality so you 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 can see that you know when the court look at the merchant quality the court do look at you know the expectations of the buyer okay the court will have to judge everything into consideration when we talk about you know this premium quality car the range rover the court said that buyers do not buy this car for driving from place to place only okay buyers would like to use this car with great pride with comfort with ease with handling with reliability and the court said we should add that customers would like to use this car with, with great pride pride in what pride in the vehicle outward and interior appearance so uh, that you know if we talk about this kind of car even though this car did not suffer you know serious technical problems but if there if there existed something which rendered this car you know to be to be what to be the to be the if it the result in given the customers not having great pride okay in the using this car even though you know the the, the this lack of great great pride resulted from some minor problems we can uh, say that okay the the goods the car okay, does not meet the uh, merge of quality the car failed to be fit for its ordinary purposes right so the, this seems to be a very important case because it gives us a lesson okay it it gives us i mean that the, the, the striking the picture that you know the court uh, will have to look at you know the circumstances of the case in order to arrive at the the judgment as to whether or not okay the car is fit uh, the goods are fit for its ordinary purposes right now remember when we talk about fitness for purposes we can just split into fitness for 
ordinary purposes and business for particular purposes. In the UK, the sales of goods act 1979, okay, also take recognition of the I the concept of fitness for particular purposes. If you look at the section 14.3, okay, 14.3 provides as follows: where the seller sells goods in the course of a business, and the buyer expressly or by implication makes known to the seller any particular purpose for which the goods are being bought, then there is an implied term that the goods supplied under the contract are reasonably fit for that purpose. That purpose means the particular purpose. If you want to buy this car not only for driving from place to place, you want to use this car you know, in mountainous or hilly areas, and you just make this known to the seller, then it is the obligation of the seller to deliver the car which is fit for this purpose, i.e. for driving in mountainous or hilly areas as well. Not only you know the fitness in the sense that it must be fit for driving from place to place. Right. So you can see that you know the ideas of fitness for purposes, be it the fitness for ordinary ordinary purpose or fitness for particular purposes, it is not anything new. So what we have seen in Article 30.2A uh, 30, 30 and 30.2B in the CIS sheet, it is not anything new at all because this concept of fitness or fitness for purposes has been known, by, has been known in the laws of many countries, including in English law. And back to English law here, yeah, the sales of goods act. The sales of goods act 1979, remember, okay? When the act talk about the fitness for particular purposes, we also have, you know, the, at least in the, this case. Well, there are a few cases which I should bring to attention, okay? But I, mean, uh, I don't think that time will permit us to just I mean, uh, talk about so many cases. So let me just talk about just one case here. Griffiths and Peter Con Conway, okay? The issue in this case was also, you know, the founded upon the fitness for particular purposes. The issue to be decided, the issue to be determined, is whether or not the goods in this case became fit for, you know, particular purposes. In this case, it's for the sales of what? The sales of, you know, the a Harry a Harry Street, tele telemet court, in the UK. You know, UK is, is also very famous for what? For brandy, brandy, uh, brandy clothes, including you know, coats. Because in the UK, it's are very very famous. Okay, I also like buying, you know, the buying jackets and also clothes in the UK. Okay, when I was a student over there. Okay, so the heritage it is of course well known for you know the for uh, telling the coats, and of course when the premium quality coats. The thing is that. Right, uh, you know the one the one the lady okay one lady meant that she bought uh do, don't look at the picture here okay i put the picture you know of the coat the the male coat but i mean the in this case it was concerned with the coats for females okay so one lady she bought this i mean the hair is to be coat but the thing is that she was very sensitive to she had very very sensitive skins in fact, I mean, her skin was abnormally sensitive, right? I mean, the thing is that I mean, when she bought this coat, she just contracted uh, the mitosis, the mitosis from what? From just wearing the coat. Well, she developed, you know, sort of skin a skin disease, right? And she claimed that this goods, this product, i.e., the coat, was not fit for for a particular purpose. She claimed that while well, the goods would have to be fit for her abnormally sensitive skin. Right. If you go back to what is said by the law, okay, what is said by you know second to uh, fourteen three here with respect to you know fitness for particular purposes, okay, fourteen fourteen three requires that buyer 
make known to the seller. Make known to the seller whether you know the whether expressly or impliedly, okay, the particular purpose for which the goods are being bought. So if, if we come back to this case, if this lady wanted the coat to be fit for her abnormally sensitive skin, she would have to just you know the uh, she would have to just make known to the seller uh, you know the abnormally sensitive skin but in this case she did not make known the skin condition to the seller so that the court rightfully held that you know the, the seller was not in breach of in the duty or the obligation to just deliver the goods which were uh, uh, which were fit for uh, you know the purposes in this case, you know, that the lady did not make known this particular purpose to the seller so that the seller did not have the obligation, okay, to just deliver the goods, the, the coat which uh, would be, you know, suitable or which would be fit for her abnormally sensitive skin. So when, you know, the, when the, 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 the seller here did not have the obligation to deliver the goods which was fit for this particular purpose, the seller would only have to deliver the goods which were which which were what which were fit for their ordinary purposes when coats here are bought for what? Are bought for wearing. Everybody you know when when everybody wears this this coat when they when the no customer will develop this skin. That means that these coats are fit for is ordinary purpose, i.e. the purpose of wearing, okay? Wearing by normal people. Right. So in this case, it was, it was here when it called that the seller, the seller, okay, that the seller generally performed the obligation to deliver the goods, uh, deliver the goods, which was of, you know, merchant quality, in the sense that it was fit for its ordinary, ordinary purpose. Right, the seller did not have the obligation to deliver the coat which was fit for this particular purpose, the purpose of wearing by, you know, uh, no, uh, a customer which had, you know, the uh, abnormally sensitive skin. Uh, the reason why, you know, the seller did not have this, uh, this obligation to deliver the goods, to deliver the coat which was fit for this particular purpose is that the buyer in this case did not make known to the seller the sensitive skin which she had you know at the time of sale right so now when we look at you know the concept of uh, merchantable, merchantable quality in the uk okay in the english law now we are going to look at what is in american law okay in american law if you look at you know the if you look at you know, the concept of merchantable Merchantability in America. Okay, the, you should know that each state has its own law. But in America, okay, there is also the Uniform Commercial Code or UCC. Okay, UCC Section 2, it is the law on sale. Okay, if you look at Section 2, Section 2, 314, okay. Section 2314, okay, in the, in the UCC, in the Uniform Commercial Code, you would, if you look at the heading for this, the heading for this provision, okay, it is the implied warranty. In, if you go back to look at, you know, the, the UK law, in the UK law, they use the word, you know, the implied, implied term, see, but in America, okay, they, they use the word implied warranty. Okay, and we also see the heading merchantable quality, merchantable, sorry, merchantability uses of threat. Okay, and if you look at paragraph one, it says, unless included or modified, a warranty that the goods shall be merchantable is implied in a contract for their sale if the seller is a merchant. So that if it is a sale by a merchant, okay. A sale by a merchant to a customer, then even even though the contract says nothing about this, but it is considered as as an implied warranty. It is considered as 
part of the contract of sale, the goods will have to be merchantable in the same that what? Okay, the sec uh, section 2, 3, 1, 4 require the goods to be merchantable. And if we look at paragraph 2, paragraph 2 of section 2, 3, 1, 4 goes on to say that goods to be merchantable must be at least such as such as meeting, you know, the, meeting the, the, you know, the factors in A, B, C, D, E, F. If you look at factor number C here, it is also very important, among others. In C, okay, in item C, you can see that uh, second two, uh, second two, three, one, four, C, say that the goods must be fit for the ordinary purposes for which such goods are used. So we can see that, you know, section uh, 2, 3, 1, 4, C here talks about what? Just talks about, you know, the requirement that goods be fit for their ordinary purposes. Okay, so this is not, you know, much different from what we have seen in, of course, in the sales of goods act or in the CISG, the United Code to 35, to A and B of the C I S G. Okay, this is why when we when we have explored the uh, the law in the UK and the US, we uh, can see that the idea or the notion of merchantability it is not anything new. It is the idea which has been known. Okay, which has long which has been known. Okay, for a long time in the laws of many countries, including in uh, English law and in American law. Now. Was what about in in Thailand? If we look at you know the eleven uh, provisions in the in Thai law as contained in the Civil and Commercial Code of Thailand, okay? Uh, in Thailand, uh, we have uh, Section uh, four seven two, four seven two of the Civil and Commercial Code, okay? Four seven two says in case of in any defect in the property sold, which impairs either its value or its fitness for ordinary purposes or for the purposes of the contract, the seller is liable. You may say, well, okay, if we look at, you know, section 472, we can see also, you know, the concept of fitness for purposes, okay, fitness for purposes in section 372, okay, which uh, seem to be you know, in line with uh, what we have seen in you know the UK law or US law or even in the CISG Article 25, 2, 1 and uh, sorry, 2 A and B. Okay, so if we compare between you know between the CISG and you know the uh, CCC of Thailand with respect to this okay fitness for purposes, we can see that CISG making mention of fitness for ordinary ordinary purposes and fitness for particular purposes while in section 472 you also find the wording here fitness for ordinary purposes and for the purposes of the contract you may just be you know you may be ready to say that for well, this what we see in section 472 it is in pretty in pretty you know the same line as what we see you know in Article 35.2 A and B in the CIG because you see the word fitness for purposes as well. Okay. Section 472. Okay, talk about fitness for purposes and uh, it is split into two parts. Fitness for ordinary purposes which may perhaps be square with, you know, fitness for ordinary purposes in Article 35, you know, 2 A. And if we are back to 472 of CCC, we also see the word fitness for the purposes of the contract. We may we may be ready to conclude that well, this is this part the fitness for the you know, purposes of the contract seem to be you know comparable to fitness for particular purposes in Article 35 uh, to B in the CISG, but. And this is a very big but. 
Okay, if we consider this matter very carefully, we will see that you know the positions in Thai's law are not really the same because you see the word defect in section 472. If you go back to 472, 472 says that in the case of any defect, okay, the defect, okay, in the case of any defect which in the property so which impairs either its value or its fitness for ordinary purposes or for the purposes of the contract, we can see that our section 472, section 472 of the civil and Commercial Code of Thailand, okay, they begin with the defect. And this defect will result in what? Will result in the impairment of the venue or will, you know, the will impair fitness for ordinary purposes or will impair fitness for, uh, you know, the purposes of the contract. Okay. And the word defect in this country, if we look at cases, as brought before the court, or if we look at you know the ideas, you know opinions of commentators in textbooks, we can see that defect, the word defect as used in Section Four Seven Two, okay, the signify what? Signify the physical defect, the defect in substances of the goods, the defect in you know the in the physical sense, defect in the substance of the goods. If there is no physical defect in the substance of the goods, then the you know the section four seven two cannot be of any help. Okay. If we go back, to, you know, the, to to the case in the UK, remember the Range Rover case. If we have a case like this, let's say that you know the uh, the buyer just has purchased you know the a very the luxurious car. Right. The buyer has purchased. Let's say that. A Mercedes Benz. Okay, of course, I mean, uh, when do you buy a Mercedes Benz, you uh, have a very high, you have indeed very high, I mean, expectations. <coughs> you expect to use the car not only for driving from place to place, but you also want to use this car with, again, great pride. Great pride in, you know, the appearance of the car. Great pride in the premium quality of this car. Okay, let's suppose that, you know, this car has no, you know, physical defect in the engine. It has no defect in the substance of the car. But the thing is that when you drive this car, when you drive, you know, that this Mercedes Benz, you feel that it is not quite smooth. Even though, you know, it can be driven right very well. Nothing, you know, wrong in the gear, nothing wrong in the steering wheel, nothing wrong in, you know, any physical substances of the car. The thing is that this car doesn't seem to be so smooth, so it is not, it, it, it does not suit your expectation, okay? So uh, if we ask the question, okay, if we ask the question as to whether or not this car is, this car has any defect and fail to be fit for, you know, the purposes according to Section 472, the answer may be in the negative. Because the defect here signifies the physical defect, the defect in some substances of the goods. When the on the facts there is nothing wrong in you know substance substances of the car, there is there is nothing wrong, you know, in the physical the dimension of the car. It is it is just that this car does doesn't doesn't turn out turn out to be smooth enough. Right. So the, in this case, we might not, we might not say that this car, you know, that this car is a non-performing car according to second four, according to second four seven two. Okay. But if we apply, you know, the concept as embodied in second thirty five two. Okay. To a. Right. We can see that this car, this Mercedes car, when it doesn't seem to be so smooth like this. It is not fit for its ordinary purpose. Because the ordinary, the ordinary purposes of buying this car include comfort is and also great pride in the use of this car, see? So we can see the limitation, okay? We can see the undesirable limitation in 
section 472, again, where section 472 uses the word defect, which, according to, you know, the cash law, or according to opinions of commentators, signifies something wrong in physical dimensions then the, when the car is not fit because it cannot be driven with great pride okay because it is not smooth enough okay so that this car has no defect according to second 472 but this car is not fit according to article 35.2 a of the cisg okay so you know if we compare between the two if we compare between the concept of you know fitness in the CAG and the concept of fitness as found in section 472 of Thailand's civil and community code, we can see differences. Okay, indeed, we can see a sub substantial difference in that Thai uh, law in section 472 of the civil and community code uses the word defect in the first place. Okay, the defect will have to impair you know the fitness for purposes so if there is no defect from the first place this means that you know that it does the case the the case in question does not fall within second 472 even in the first place right so that okay the uh, so that you know the when there is no defect so when there is no defect here Okay, this car is fine. This car cannot be said as being unfit. Right, so this is limitation in Thai law. Right. So now when we have seen the concept of you know fitness for purposes, let me move on to talk about you know the, the right to cure the lack of conformity. The right to cure the lack of conformity it is also a very important thing in the CISG, right to cure. In fact, mean that you do not see the word cure in the CAG. The CAG uses the word remedy. But normally, okay, the, the right to remedy the lack of conformity, it is, you know, in, uh, you know, in an academic sense, in an academic sense, it is known as, you know, the, the concept of cure, right? Cure in the CAG can be permissible both before the date of delivery and after the date for delivery, okay? Care before the date for delivery. It is found in the Article 37, why the care, the right to care after the date for the delivery is embodied in Article 48, okay? The thing is that, let's support that, if you are interested in, the, in the reading the wording, okay, you can just mean the, have the reading by yourself here, but uh, for the purpose of our teaching now, okay, I don't think that Tom will just permit me to just have a read, okay, uh, word by word, I mean, the, what you see in Article 30, uh, 30, 37 or Article 38 in the CISG. Okay, put simply, both Article 37 and Article 38 gives the Senate the right to kill or the right to remedy. The right to remedy the lack of conformity if the goods do not com conform with the contract in any sense, remember, uh, in a sense of quality, in a sense of quality, in a sense of description, or in, a, in, a, in the dimension of packaging, if there is any, anything wrong with respect to quality, quality, description, or packaging, then, okay, even, even though, okay, that lack of conformity is found before the date of delivery or even after the date of delivery then the seller still has the right to kill this lack of conformity as for well that the seller does not deliver the goods in the correct quality as required by the contract that is also the lack of conformity the seller can still kill by what by just sending Okay, sending when the sending the missing parts, right? The seller in a way can just do what the seller can just remedy. Remember the official word as you see the CAG is remedy. Remedy of course means remedies means cure. The seller may just remedy at his own expense 
any failure to perform his obligation, okay, if the seller can do so without unreasonable delay and without causing the buyer unreasonable inconvenience, that's mean that, okay, if the kill does not cause this, if the kill does not cause the buyer unreasonable inconvenience, the buyer will have to allow the seller to kill. The buyer will have to tolerate the kill. The buyer can, cannot say, sorry, sorry, no, I do not want you to kill. If you do not, you know, they deliver the goods in the manner which corresponds, which means which conform with the contract, then I do not want you to kill. I want to claim remedies as available to me by the CISG. The seller can, the buyer cannot, cannot say that. The law said that, okay, what the CAG says is that if the kill does not cause the buyer unreasonable, unreasonable inconvenience, the buyer will have to allow the seller to kill, the buyer will have to tolerate the kill. So, okay, the, the significance or consequences of the kill is this. The, the consequences of the exercise of the right to kill by the seller are this first. Okay, when the sellers want to kill, uh, provided that the kill does not cause unreasonable inconvenience to the buyer, the buyer will have to accept the kill. And from then on, okay, the, the buyer may not exercise the right to avoid a contract. The intention of the CHG is that once the seller wants to kill and the kill does not cause unreasonable uh, inconvenience to the, to the buyer, the buyer will have to allow the seller to go ahead with the kill. And during the period of curing, the, the buyer may not, may not award a contract, okay, so that in a way the CIHG prevent the buyer from what? From bringing the contract to an end. The CIAG just stops the buyer from what? From awarding the contract when the sellers want to kill. So in the way, the provision of law which you know which allows the seller to kill and which stops the buyer from you know exercising the right to you know, to just award a contract, it is to preserve the contract. So it is an attempt to preserve the contract. So we can see that many provisions of the CHG are framed or are designed in the way of preserving the contract. So the preservation of the contract principle, it is a very important principle of the CIHG. We will see later, okay, when we when we discuss many other remedies as well as by you know by the buyer in the CHG, we can see that the provisions of the CHG are designed in or along the line of the preservation of the contract rule, okay? Again, okay, the right to kill, it is recognized in the CIHG, the seller may kill the lack of the property, okay, the boss before the date for delivery, and, and after the date of delivery, okay, if the kill does not cause unreasonable, unreasonable inconvenience to the buyer, the buyer will have to allow the seller to kill and okay during the kill the buyer may not exercise the right to avoid the contract hence the preservation of the contract okay that is you know the very important uh, you know rationale of the kill provision okay of the CISG right there now one thing which we need also to address is this one of course when the seller Deliver the goods which do not conform with the contract. That is the breach. Okay. If there is any lack of conformity, the seller commits indeed a breach of contract. Right. Of course, when there is a breach of contract, well, there are many remedies available to the buyer. We will talk about many remedies available to the buyer in the second half of the lecture. But now, one thing which we need to address is this one. Okay. Even though the buyers has, you know, the several remedies under the CIHG, the CIHG 
the impulse is only by one important duty, the duty to, the duty to do what? The duty to give the notice, the notice of the lack of conformity. If the goods delivered by the, by, by the seller do not conform with the contract, the buyer will have to give notice of the lack of conformity to the seller. If the buyer does not give the notice of the lack of conformity, then the CAG will punish the buyer by taking away, taking away from the buyer the right to rely on the lack of conformity. That means that if the buyer does not inform the seller of the lack of conformity, then the CIHG will treat as if goods were in conformity with the contract. Even though you know that even the, the goods have some lack of conformity, if the buyer does not give notice of the lack of conformity to the seller, then the CIHG stop the buyer from claiming that the goods okay, are non-conforming goods. CIHG will treat that the goods are perfectly okay in conformity with the contract okay so if the buyer does not give notice of the lack of conformity the buyer will just lose the right to rely on the lack of conformity you may wonder why okay why CHE takes away from the buyer you know the the right to rely on the lack of, of conformity if the buyer does not give notice of the lack of conformity to the seller the reason is simple. The, re the reason, the important reason is just that, well, okay, the requirement that the buyer give notice to the seller, the notice of the lack of conformity, it is to enable the seller to kill. If the seller does not know about the lack of conformity, then the seller will not have a chance of caring. Okay, remember the care? Here provision, it is a provision which is designed to preserve the contract. So if the seller wants to care, it will stop the buyer from exercising the right to avoid the contract, remember. So if the buyer does not tell the seller about the lack of conformity, there is no way that the seller can just exercise the right to care. So when the seller cannot care because of you know, the failure of the buyer to give notice of the lack of conformity, then the buyer should not have revenues. That's why the CAG does say that the buyer will just lose the right to rely on the lack of conformity if the buyer does not give notice of conformity to the seller. Okay. The requirement that the buyer give the notice of, you know, the, the notice of lack of conformity to the seller is the duty embodied in Article 39 of the CIHG. Okay, 39 provides as follows. The buyer loses the right to rely on a lack of conformity of goods if he does not give notice to the seller specifying the nature of the lack of conformity within a reasonable time after he has discovered it or ought to have discovered it. The important, the important thing is that this is a duty to give notice of the lack of conformity. If the goods do not conform with the contract in any aspect, be it the aspect of quality, quality, description, or packaging, or any any other things, okay, the buyer will have to give the notice of the lack of conformity to the seller, right? So the <coughs> one thing which you need to note, okay, in, in relation to the duty of the buyer to give notice of the lack of conformity to the seller is that the notice required by section by Article Thirty Nine of the CIHG, okay, it is not just plain notice or you know simple notice. It must specify to the nature of the lack of conformity so the requirement of what the requirement of specificity it is very important okay CIHG imposes the specificity requirement in that 
the notice to be given by the buyer to the seller must specify the nature of the lack of conformity. Put simply, the buyer will have to give details as as many details as possible in order for the seller to understand okay the lack of conformity and to be able to cure right so uh, the specificity requirement is so important you may the you know the ask question how specific as i have mentioned okay this specificity requirement it is the requirement that the notice give the details so that so the de the details that enable the seller to understand okay the lack of conformity and to be able to exercise the right to kill so you know if the, the buyer gives the notice without specifying such details then that means that the notice which is given by the buyer does not comply with the specificity requirement so that that notice will be considered as bad notice hence the loss of you know right of the buyer to rely on the lack of conformity okay we can see this you know the in many cases when you know when when the buyer even though the buyer trying to give a notice to the seller the notice of the lack of conformity but the notice as given by the buyer okay did not contain sufficient details the court uh, or the tribunal the found that you know, notice in question uh, would not be good notice as required you know, by the CIHG. In one case, among the uh, many cases on this point, okay, it was found that the notice which did not you know, identify the serial numbers of the goods uh, did not seem to be the good notice. Okay? It, did not, okay, it did not meet the specificity requirement in the CIHG okay, to use the word as used in the article 39.1, the notice failed to specify the nature of the lack of conformity. Okay, so you have to just pay attention okay, to the specificity requirement here. And there are also many other cases under which or in which okay, the court or the tribunal found the notice in question as not good notice in the sense that it did not meet the specificity requirement okay the in one case when the goods uh, were found to be missing okay so when the seller did not deliver the goods in the correct quantity as required by the contract right even though the buyer just gave the notice to the seller that okay the goods delivered to the buyer whatever well, the, were deficient in terms of the quantity but the thing is that the notice as given by the buyer did not specify which goods were missing so that it was found that the notice of this buyer okay there was not good notice as required by the CIHG so when the buyer failed to give the notice the good notice according to the CIHG the consequence would be that this buyer would have to lack sorry would have to lose the right to rely on the lack of conformity okay also there in one case it was a sales of fabric. The fabric which was sold by the you know, seller to the buyer did not you know, have uh, the quality requirement contract. Uh, the buyer wanted to buy this fabric for making of uh, for making clothes, okay, and the fabric turned out to be you know, to be uh, not to be what they were not fit for the for being cut in an economic the fashion okay it could not be used for you know tailoring the clothes so in this case the buyer just gave a notice to the seller but the thing is that the notice is given by this buyer to the seller did not specify the nature of the quality problem the buyer did not explain to you know the this explain to the seller uh, in what sense the fabric could not be cut into uh, you know, to cut in the uh, economic fashion, okay, so that the seller could not understand the lack of conformity. When the seller could not understand this, the seller would not be in a position to exercise the right to care. So the thing, so when the, the notice given by the buyer did not meet the specificity requirement, 
Okay, when the notice I means they did not seem to be the good notice because it failed to meet the specificity requirement in the CIG, okay, the consequent would be that the buyer would lose the right to rely on the lack of conformity. The goods would have to be treated by the CIG as conforming goods, even though they were not conforming goods. Right, so the yeah, right, I try to just come to you know, the, the last part of uh, this lecture, okay, in the first half of my lecture uh, this evening, okay? Remember, right, remember, uh, the CIHC required the buyer to give notice uh, of the lack of conformity to the seller. If the buyer does not give notice of the lack of conformity to the seller, then the CIHC will punish the, the buyer the, by uh, by take, taking away from the buyer the right to rely on the lack of, of conformity, that means that the goods will have to be treated as conforming goods. Okay, but there are two exceptions. Even though the buyer does not give notice of the lack of conformity to the seller, the buyer does not lose the right to rely on the lack of, of, of conformity. Exception number one is that the sellers. Okay, the seller, the seller acts in best fits. Okay, that means that the seller knew or could not have been unaware of the lack of conformity. Remember the rationale of the requirement of the the, the, the requirement of the, the notice of con, lack of con, for, for conformity is just that it is a way to is a way to what it is a way to enable the seller to exercise the right to care, even though the buyer does not give a notice of the lack of conformity, but if the seller knows about that, if the seller knew about it or could not have been unaware of it, well, that means that the seller could be in the position to kill the lack of conformity in the first place, so that, okay, the fellow of the buyer to give notice of the lack of conformity should not deprive the buyer okay, the, of the right to rely on the lack of conformity so that when section article 40 here you know, sometimes you know I just try to use the word section okay rather than article but I mean the in the CAG okay the CAG uses the word article not section right article 40 40 in the CAG say that the seller is not entitled to rely on the provision of article 38 or 39 remember 39 it is the provision of the provision which takes away the buyer's right to rely on the lack of, of conformity if the lack of conformity relates to facts of which he knew or could not have been unaware and which he did not disclose to the buyer that means that well the seller knew about you know the lack of conformity in the first place or the seller could not have been unaware of this you say that the seller okay is in a position to kill at the outset so that in this case okay there is no need for the buyer to give the seller the notice of the lack of conformity even though the seller sorry even though the buyer does not give the seller this notice of the lack of conformity it should not be the ground for losing the right okay the, or losing the right to rely on the lack of conformity okay so this, uh, this seems to be very 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 obvious okay now the exception number two is that okay remember we talk about exceptions the rule is that where the goods do not conform with the contract then the buyer will have to inform the seller the buyer will have to give a notice of the lack of conformity which on sale you know meets the specificity requirements as well remember otherwise the buyer will just lose the right to rely on the lack of conformity but remember there are two exceptions the first one is that if the seller okay, acts in best face in that the seller knew about the facts or the seller could not have been unaware of that fact which, which led to the lack of conformity, then in that case, even though the buyer does not 
give the notice of the lack of conformity, the buyer can still rely on the lack of conformity. Okay, and can claim and can and can ex and can do what and can just resort to many remedies available to the buyer. Okay, the exception number two is that failure to failure to give the notice of the lack of conform of conformity is accusable. The buyer has some excuse. The buyer has excuse for failure to give the notice of the lack of conformity. Okay, this exception is found in you know section forty four. Right, forty four say that right, notwithstanding provision of article thirty nine, right, the buyer may uh, reduce the price or claim damages. If he has a reasonable excuse for his failure to give the required notice, that means that even though the buyer fails to give the notice of the lack of conformity, the buyer can still have remedies. The buyer will not lose remedies under CAG. The buyer will have remedies, but you have to just note that even though you know that this, even though this is the exception. When the buyer has a reasonable excuse for not giving notice to the to the seller, okay, the buyer still have remedies, but the remedies which are available to the buyer in this case are limited to first reduction of price, and secondly claiming damages other than the loss of profit. Damages, okay, damages except for loss of profit. That means that okay with respect with respect to the exception number two okay it does not mean that the buyer will retain full remedies. If the buyer has a reasonable excuse for not giving notice of the lack of of conformity, the buyer still have some remedies but there are only two remedies available to the buyer here claiming reduction of price and claiming damages for loss other than the loss of profit. Apart from these two remedies, buyers will not be able to resort to other remedies. This means that these remedies are limited, very, very limited. Okay, so that means that maybe that, that is the result of the, you know, the result of the attempts to protect interest of the first world country. Remember, uh, you know, that maybe the buyers, uh, the buyers may be in, you know, in the, the developing, in the developing country. So that the buyer may not, okay, may, may not be able to find, you know, the lack of conformity, right, so that when the buyer is unable to find the lack of conformity, the buyer does not give notice to the seller. But the buyer may have a good a good excuse. The buyer may have you know the, a good excuse for not being able to find or to discover you know, the lack of, con of conformity. In that case, CAG say fine, buyers, we still allow you to to you know to uh, claim the lack of conformity. You may still resort to some remedies, but the developed country try to, you know, try to have a pressure on this. The developed country say, okay, we allow you, the developing country, okay, you are the developing country, you still have remedies, but we allow you to have just two remedies in this case. Reducing the price and claiming damages for loss, which is not the loss of profit. Apart from these two items, you will not resort to any other remedies. See? So this seems to be the compromise between, you know, the, this seems to be the comp compromise between the interests of the first world countries and the third world countries. Right. Now, when we talk about a reasonable excuse, you may wonder, well, I mean, uh, what sort of thing can constitute, you know, a reasonable excuse according to 
uh, you know, according to Article 44 of the CISG, right? We should, you know, we should, you know, realize that yeah. the use of the reasonable excuse expression here, it is okay. The the expression reasonable excuse here, it is used by the CHG as the what? As the exception to the general rule. The general rule is that if there is any lack of conformity in the goods, then the buyer will have to give the seller the notice of the lack of conformity, except that the buyer has a reasonable excuse. So, okay, the wording as regards a reasonable excuse, it is the wording used in the part which constitutes the exception, so that the exception must be interpreted narrowly, okay? So that, if you look at case law, if you look at cases decided by the you know, tribunals or by the courts in many countries, you can see that the word re reasonable accused is very, very narrowly interpreted. Okay, the in one case, okay, the, it has been the found that when the buyer is of a small size, the buyer did not, you know, have, uh, you know, a sufficient number of employees working full time for examination of the goods, then that could constitute a reasonable case according to Article Forty Four of the CISG. Well, I mean, this this seems to be very 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 dubious. Okay, the, the size, the small size of the company, uh, probably may, may not be uh, normally used, you know, the, as a, an excuse in the not being able to find out the lack of conformity, right? Uh, but one thing, one in one case, this is very interesting, okay? And I think that this case provides us with a very, a very I mean, good example of the good excuse or the or a reasonable accused according to uh, Article 44 of the CISG. In this case, the goods in question, okay, the goods in question were, uh, were what? Were few, were few, the cook few, okay, the, so the, the goods did not seem to be in conformity with the contractual requirements. And Okay, the, the goods were examined. They were examined by an independent inspector. And indeed, both parties, both the seller and the buyer, jointly appointed this independent inspector. When the independent inspector conducted the, the examination of the goods, the inspector just issued a certificate of analysis. The certificate of analysis confirmed that the goods were in conformity with the you know, contractual requirements, right? But in fact, they were not. The goods did not you know, conform with the contract in terms of quantity and quality, okay? So, but the thing is that given that, you know, the, the independent inspectors, the independent inspector was jointly appointed by both parties, the buyer in this case seemed to rely on the inspector. Right. When the certificate as issued by the inspectors was erroneous, the buyer, you know, did not go ahead with, you know, further inspection, okay? The buyer trusted that certificate and when the buyer found out about the lack of conformity, it was too late. The notice as given by the buyer was not timely anymore. That means that the notice was too late. Remember, you know, the CAG required notice to be given, okay, within a reasonable period of time, when in this case, notice was rather late, right, it was not a good notice, so that, okay, normally, right, I mean, it could lead to the consequence that the buyer would lose the right to rely on the lack of conformity. But in this case, it was here that, right, the buyer, the buyer's failure to give a notice of the lack of conformity, okay. 
the boy, the fellow to give notice had a reasonable excuse because of the fact that you know that both parties, the seller and the buyer, even jointly appointed the inspector, so that when the buyer relied on his certificate analysis given by the inspector, that was something falling within expectation of the buyer, so that when the buyer gave a notice which seemed to be late like this, the buyer had a reasonable excuse for not giving the good notice. Okay, so that in this case, the buyer did not lose the right to rely on the lack of conformity. The buyer could still okay, claim uh, you know, the remedies which are available to, to the buyer in the CISG. Okay, so that's it for the first part of the lecture. Okay? Uh, after, the, after the first part of the lecture, okay, we will resume the class in a few moments and we will talk about bridge and remedies. That is the last part, okay, the, the last part for the topic of the CIHG. Okay, after the lecture today, okay, next week we will not talk about the CIHG anymore, okay. We will move on to discuss issues, uh, the legal issues surrounding e electronic comments. Okay, so that is for now, so uh, we are going to have a break for about 10 to 15 minutes and then we will soon, okay, resume the class. Thank you very much for your attention and see you very soon. Okay.